Our text for this morning is taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14, beginning with verse 30. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. Thus far, the word of the Lord. Let me also thank those of you who volunteered for the glory event that was here on this past Friday and Saturday. It was a great event for all who attended and the people at Lifeway were impressed by the level of service that we, that we gave. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. I want to deal with this subject, radical obedience. Radical obedience. I want to start with this question. What is the length to which you will obey God? What is the length to which you will obey God? How far would you obey God? At what point could God give you a directive and you draw the line and say no more? I want you to just think about it. What is the length? What is the extent to which you would obey God? What could God think of saying to you that you would say, not that? Not that. Not that. And before you say, well, there's nothing that that God could ask me to do that I would not say, not that. Put yourself in Abraham's place. God telling Abraham to offer up his son as a burnt offering unto him. Would would that be the line at which you would say, uh, now, now, God, I love you. God, I trust you. But that is a little much for me. How, how far, I, I, had, I found myself asking myself, how far will I obey God? Is there, is there, is there something that, that, that God would introduce to me for me to obey? And I would say, not that, not that. I found myself asking that when I read this passage. Hadn't paid much attention to it before, but but on a recent reading, it landed like a ton of bricks. It's the night on which Jesus is to be betrayed. Jesus has demonstrated servant leadership by washing his disciples' feet. He has instituted the Lord's Supper. He has alerted them of his impending betrayal. He has signaled to them of his subsequent departure and has bequeathed peace unto them. And right afterwards, Jesus speaks of Satan's approaching to do him harm. And he then notes that Satan has no power or authority over him. Satan has no sway that could directly Fulfill what Satan desires. There's no sin in Jesus of which Satan can accuse Jesus. No 
guilt or shame that Satan can use to manipulate Jesus. No, no wile, no, no scheme that he can employ, which he can ensnare Jesus. There's no leverage that he can exert against Jesus. In other words, Satan can't get to Jesus on his own. The only way that it can happen is if Jesus lets him. The only way that Judas carries out the betrayal is if Jesus lets him. The only way that the soldiers take Jesus into custody is if Jesus lets them. The only way that Jesus is sentenced by Pilate is if Jesus lets him. The only way that Jesus would be nailed on a cross and remain on a cross is if Jesus lets it happen. In any of those instances, Jesus could have resisted and refused. He could have withstood to the, the approach and the actions of the enemy. He could have thwarted the efforts. Instead, he chose to allow it all to come. And the only reason why is because it would be the context for him to do what the Father requires. Jesus would allow Satan to approach and act against him because the Father required it. That need, I need for you to let that land and sink in that, that Jesus yields to the devil's approach and action because God required it. And from this, my friends, Jesus reveals that there are some points of obedience that are pursued simply because the Father requires it. Glad we got our shout in early. This word for required is that of command. It is of commission. It's the word that Jesus uses to speak of his commanding, his commissioning the disciples in Matthew chapter 28 and Acts chapter 1. It's also used when Jesus speaks of his command to love in John 15, 14, a new commandment. Give I unto you that ye love one another. Jesus' commission from the Father includes Satan's approach and actions. Jesus' life under God's orders puts him in the proximity of Satan and those whom Satan would use to harm Jesus. Because, friends, I need for us to understand living under the orders of God may include periods of vulnerability to satanic approach and attack. That there are times when that which God has commissioned for you includes something coming against you which you must face. Jesus would give himself to the approach and attack of the enemy because God required it as the context for Jesus doing what God required of him. And here we see that the life of obedience is not just giving yourself to the content of God's will, but also the context of God's will. Not just the content, but the context. The life of surrender to God is not just the life that gives itself to the what of God's purpose. It also gives itself to the when, how, and where of God's purpose. In other words, pursuing the what of God for your life is never in a vacuum. It is within a context of how, when, where, and with whom? And my friends, as difficult as the content of God's will may be, the context can be even more difficult. 
The content of God's will for Jesus was for Jesus to be the Savior of the world. But the context of God's will was his dying at the age of 33. The context was his being betrayed by one of his own disciples, being falsely accused and mistried. The context was his being denied by one of his intimate road dogs. The context was his being flogged and beaten and bruised. The context was his carrying a cross and then being crucified, suffering the most agonizing form of capital punishment ever devised by Rome. The content is one thing, but the context is a whole different story. And my friends, sometimes it's not the content of God's purpose for our lives. It's the context of God's purpose for our lives. Because radical obedience is not just that which says yes to the content. But you got to be willing to say yes to the context. The context of being conformed to the image of Christ includes suffering some of the same things that Christ suffered. The context of developing a great faith includes facing challenges that press you beyond the limits of your human capacity and understanding the context of being a faithful witness to God is often that of enduring trials and tragedies that you yourself would never have chosen to come your way. Sometimes it's not the content. It's the context. Sometimes, sometimes when, you, when you're faced with the context, you have to ask God, God, does it have to be this way? God, does it have to include this? God, God, God does, it, does, it, does, it, does it have to involve this coming my way? It's not just the content. It's the context. The context of Jesus is fulfilling the purpose of God would be the approach and activity of Satan himself. Not just some hellions, the devil himself. And here it is, within that context, Jesus would do <laughs> what the Father requires. In other words, the approach and actions of Satan don't give Jesus a pass from doing what God requires. He isn't exempt from what the Father requires with Satan doing what Satan does. With Satan doing what Satan does, Jesus must do what the Father requires. People plotting and scheming, Jesus got to do what the Father requires. One disciple betraying him, another disciple denying him, all others leaving him. When the rubber meets the road, Jesus still must do what the Father requires. People lying on him, Pilate looking for any reason to let him go. Jesus still must do what the Father requires. And man, that, man that, that, that hit me, Malcolm, because it, it said to me, the approach and activity of the enemy do not give us a pass from obeying God. <laughs> Lord, Lord. That's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, isn't it? With the enemy doing what the enemy does, we are still called to pursue God's purpose and, our, and God's path. We are still called to live a life of obedience even when it puts us closer to the enemy's reach. We're called to a life of obedience even when the enemy's agenda seems to be advancing. Called to a life of obedience even when Doing so makes us look weak and vulnerable to the eyes of the world. You know, you would, you would think that, that Jesus would have gotten tired of doing what the Father required. I mean, look at how long he's been doing it. At the age of 12, he was saying, didn't you know I must be about my Father's business? Throughout his earthly ministry, he alerted anyone with ears to hear that he was just doing what the Father showed him. His meat was to do the will of, of the Father who sent him. And his life of obedience was not just in what he did, but also what he did not do. I want you to imagine having the power to heal. And rather than 
healing Joseph, his earthly father. Jesus watches Joseph become sick and even die. Imagine having the power to raise him. And he doesn't raise him from the dead. Imagine having the, the power that he possessed living under Roman domination and oppression and not lifting himself and others from underneath that oppressive regime. Can you imagine the very betrayer dipping in a bowl with you? Dipping in the dish a, a most intimate form of table fellowship and Jesus not attempting to change Judas's mind, not even outing Judas with the other 11? Imagine Jesus having answers that he could have given Pilate with all that Pilate needed to let him go and Jesus not answering. I got to admit to you that as challenging as the doing of obedience is, the not doing of obedience is even more challenging. It's what God doesn't let me do, doesn't let me say, doesn't let me respond. Am I talking to anybody? Is, is it just me? Is, is, there, is, is there anybody who can, who can admit that, that, that sometimes uh, the obedient not doing is more difficult than the obedient doing. Everything within you wants to get them told. Set them straight. Defend yourself. Assert yourself. Knock them in the next year. And the Lord says, not so. You can't do it. You can't say it. You can't respond. Sometimes it's not, it's not what he tells you to do. It's what he tells you not to do. And you know, in my, in my own mind, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just talking about me. I don't know about you. There should be some situations where what the devil does gives you a pass to be as hellish as you want to be. Am I, am I, am I talking to anybody? There, there, there should be some instances when hell rises up and you should be able to meet hell on its own level. And Sister Covenant, God says, not so. Not so, not, not so, not, not so. I, <laughs> I, I wonder if Jesus ever got tired of having to be Jesus. <laughs> I, I wonder, I wonder. I, you know, John, John says, I didn't write everything that I could have written. So I wonder if some of that stuff that John left out was Jesus just being tired of being Jesus. Because, you know, sometimes I get tired. I get tired of having to be the grown-up in the room. <laughs> The adult in the situation, the Christian in the circumstance. God, 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 can I be held just one moment? Just, 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 just one, just one, just one, just one, because, because you know, I, I got this robe on, but I don't, I don't feel loving all the time, forgiving all the time, patient all the time, all the time. Put in that chat, me too, me too, me too. I don't, I, I don't. And so here's Jesus, 33 years old. Satan approaching him, that, that being the context for him doing what the Father requires. And I, I I had to ask, what keeps Jesus doing what the Father requires? I can see being obedient in one instance, but Jesus just keeps on obeying. <laughs> what keeps Jesus continuing to obey? And Jesus 
Jesus shows us in what he says. Let's, let's look at it again. He says, I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. <laughs> Jesus' life of radical obedience was a witness to the world. Jesus says every, everything that he would do and not do would be a witness to the world both in real time and in sacred reflection. That is, as we read about it. His suffering, his obedience, his dying on the cross and subsequent resurrection. That would be a witness to the world. In other words, Jesus says the world has to come to know something through my obedience. His obedience was to be a revelation to the world. And the particular witness to the world is his love for God the Father. He says, I, people are going to be watching me. And, and, and I want them to draw one conclusion. I love the Father. People would come to understand his relationship with God the Father being one of love. The Father loved him and he loved the Father. His delight was to do the will of the Father, but it was driven by his delight in the Father and with the Father. The expression of his love for the Father was his pursuit of the purpose and path that the Father had for him. And when he got weary with the world, he was buoyed by his love for the Father. When the disciples got on his nerves and Pharisees got under his skin, he was held by his love for the Father. Satan had no claim on him. Satan could not manipulate him or, or trick him or, or, or scheme him. His love for the Father, that was the claim. His love for the Father propels him to do what the Father requires even at the cost of his life. All that Jesus did and all that Jesus would do from that moment on was from the fountain of love that he had for the Father. My friends, radical obedience is prompted and sustained by a love for God. Prompted and sustained by a love for God. The sustained impulse, I'm talking about the sustained. I'm not talking about, you know, that, that feeling that you get that gets you started. I'm talking about the sustained impulse to obey, to pursue the purpose and path of God for our lives is a love for God. That, because friends, here it is, that to which we give ourselves reveals what we love. Whatever you give yourself to on a consistent basis, that reveals what you love. Whatever you find yourself doing over, 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 over again, that that is the impulse that you obey. And that reveals what you love. Whatever you act, whatever you give yourself to is an act of obedience and reveals what or whom you love. And right there, that's a, that's a moment for examination. What does my consistent action reveal what or whom I love? What does my consistent action reveal in terms of who I obey? Our giving ourselves in obedience to God is sustained by a love for God. Verses 21, 23 through 24, Jesus told the disciples, those who accept my commandments and obey them, here it is, are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. 
And then two verses down, Jesus says, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. Love for Jesus is cast within the context of obedience to his commands, which come from the Father. It is our love for God, which is a response to God's love for us, that prompts sustained obedience. While the fear of God may prompt initial obedience, a mature life with God is one where obedience to God flows from a love for God. You see, some, some, sometimes we obey God because we're scared. Just be honest. There, there, there are just some things you just scared. And that's the way it is when you're a child in the house of your parents. Right? Scared. But what happens when you leave the parents' home? Do you still obey? Do you still live in the standard? It's no longer being driven by fear. you got to be driven by something else. And it's the same way with God. Sustained obedience is not one driven by fear of God. It's driven by love for God. You will recall that, that, when, that when Jesus deals with Peter after the resurrection, he doesn't ask him, Peter, do you fear me? He says, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, are you intimidated by me? No. Peter, do you love me? Tend my lambs. Because Jesus understood it's only when you love him that you will be sustained in the way of him. God's way for us is shaped by God's love for us. It causes us to know that whatever path that God has ordained, it's shaped by God's loving us, that, that to which God calls us is not for our ill, but for our good. And when we know that, we are empowered to give ourselves to that. My friends, when you understand that, that the path that God has outlined for you and the obedience to which he calls you is not to harm you, it's to help you, then you are empowered to give yourself to it. Even when you don't understand it and sometimes when you don't even like it, you believe that God loves you. And therefore, you give yourself to it. That's where, that's where Jesus is. Listen to the last words of that chapter. Come, <laughs> let's be going. The devil is approaching. Actions are coming his way. Jesus says, come, let's be going. He says, the time for talk is over. Got a few more chapters with something to say, but then it's going to be done. Come, let's be going because my passion is at hand. My suffering is approaching me. The hour for which I came into the world is now coming my way. In some other translations, it reads, rise up. Ah, propelled, listen to this, propelled by his love for the Father, Jesus rises to the occasion. My friends, there are some situations you will not rise to the occasion out of fear. you got to love your way in rising to the occasion. And Jesus rises to the occasion because he knows that the Father's love, hear me now, secured him with an outcome that's greater than Satan's approach and attack. He's secured by the fact, even though I'm saying yes to the devil's approach, the outcome is greater than what Satan's going to do. Yes, there's going to be Judas's betrayal. Yes, there's going to be Peter's denial. Yes, there's going to be the disciples fleeing the scene. But the outcome is going to be greater than that. Yes, there would be the lies told about him. Yes, there would be the scourging. Yes, there would be the crown of thorns. Yes, there would be the carrying of the cross. Yes, there would be the hanging high and stretching wide. But the outcome, hear me, 
would be greater than the attempt. Yes, it would be the taunting of the crowd, the bearing of our sins, and the darkness between the sixth and the ninth hour. Yes, there would be the crying out in agony. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But the outcome was going to be greater than what he had to endure. Yes, there would be the giving up of the ghost, burying in the grave. Yes, there would be the claims of victory by the enemy. Yes, there would be the actions to be endured. But the outcome, hear me, belongs to the Father. The outcome was greater than the enemy's approach and action. The outcome was Jesus lifted up above the earth. And beginning to draw all men unto him. The outcome was a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunging beneath that flood. And losing all their guilty stains. The outcome was Jesus descending into hell. Preaching to the spirits held captive. Taking the keys of death and hell. The outcome was God raising Jesus from the dead. Being the firstborn from the dead. The outcome was Jesus being the captain of our salvation the bishop of our souls the author and finisher of our faith the outcome was Jesus having a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father I'm trying I'm just trying to help somebody understand the testimony is that God in his love never allows Satan to come towards you Without having a plan to bring you through. I want somebody to hear me. God will never allow Satan to have access. Without God having the outcome in his hand. And the God who is God. He's the God who brings you through. And I believe I've got some witnesses uh, who can testify that the outcome is that God brought you through. When things were the darkest that they could be. When the weight to seem to be more heavy than you could carry. When the pain was more intense than you ever thought that you could bear. God, Lord have mercy, was able to bring you through. When the enemy looked like he had the upper hand and nobody thought you'd be able to come back. God, hear me, brought you through. God had the outcome and brought you through. God had the outcome and brought you past. God had the outcome and brought you over. God had the outcome. Even when you couldn't see it, God had it. Even when you didn't feel it, God had it. Even if you didn't believe it, God had it. Oh, hallelujah. 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 If I'm talking to those to whom the Lord has already brought through. You need to just shout brought through. You need to put in the chat brought through. And there may be somebody you're not all the way through. But he's bringing you through. You feel the tug and pull and push of the Lord. Even when you don't have any more energy to go one more step. But the Lord is bringing you through. And because of that. You're persuaded to follow him. Because of that, you're persuaded to fulfill his will. Because of that, you're following the path. Not always understanding. Not always liking. But because you know the Father loves you. And because you know the Father has the outcome in his hand. Because you believe that every good and perfect gift still comes from the Father. Because you believe all things work together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. You're still following. You haven't given up. You haven't thrown in the towel because your trust and love for the Father causes you to know the Lord loves me. If he thought I was to die for, he thinks I'm worth living for. Lord have mercy. He wouldn't have just thought to die for me without having a plan for me living in this life until I see him. I believe that he has a plan for me. And I believe he's going to bring me through. And so every day I just got to wake up and lift my hands in total adoration unto the one who reigns on the throne. To the one who is God and God alone. Because of him, my cloudy days. I have some cloudy days. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Don't be fooled. 
Don't let this sermon fool you. Don't let the smile fool you. I've had some cloudy days. Mm, mm, mm. And wondered when the sun would ever shine again. But I knew that God still loved me. God still had a plan for me. And that though I couldn't see the sun, it was still on the other side. There's something I learned about God. Clouds don't stay forever. Hey, clouds don't stay forever. The wind moves them and the sky becomes clear.